Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank, and my other really good pal, Brett Simmons. How come he gets a really? Come on. Is I mean... he better than me? Well, I've known... <laughs> I... I've known Brett a little longer, Ty. It's it's okay. the mustache, right? <laughs> it's, he, he graduated he has, to the really status. That Magnum PI mustache. <laughs> that's what gave him the really. I know. I know where your head is. I mean, think about it, Brett. Like, think about how many, how long. It's crazy to think how long we've Maybe known we each other. Maybe we shouldn't think about you know? it because that's I, like a long time. Yeah, because, but but I think that, I think when I first, even when I very first met you, I don't think Maverick no. was even born yet. I mean, I met you right after I made. I, I met That's you right after I made the husk short, and I'm depressed to think about how long ago that was. Yeah, a long time, man. Yeah, you know what's crazy is you know we were talking in the um we were talking at the Bruce Campbell thing, and we were talking about after, and you told me about the idea of husk. That's right. And then you know we had that conversation, whatever, and you're like, man, that'd be great to have you be yeah. a part of this. Remember? <laughs> and then uh, and then it happened. And then it ended up you know then it ended up happening. We all went we all went to <laughs> Wonderful Iowa. Wonderful Iowa. <laughs> that was awesome. I was looking for your short film and I found an interview of you. Oh. Uh like an yeah, like the hour long interview. And and here's the thing is I know I know now why you wear the stash because in that interview you look like a baby. Uh, yeah, you look like you're twelve. You guys, it's <laughs> it was actually a real big problem in that time of my life trying to get movies made because everyone thought I was like so young. I used to hope I was going yeah. like prematurely gray just to like help or something. Can we watch the uh really yeah the stash funny. makes Can a big difference. Can we watch the the his interview? Oh god. It's like an hour long. Well, yeah, you it's, just it's you long. just got to see this this baby like he looks like a 21. You're well how old were you when you did it? it? Well, here's the thing like I when I went to Sundance with the short film, I was the youngest director they've ever had. Oh wow. I was 23 really? years old, yeah. And then when Wes and I made the feature, I was 27. Wow. But it was embarrassing. So, Brett, just so you know, B-roll of that is going to be coming in here. I'm, I'm just okay. I mean, that's how I'm, I roll. I'm, you guys, I, I love you guys. Anything for the podcast, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I give you full reign. But whew, it's like I told. I just undid the password on Husk because I was like, well, I guess if we're going to talk about it, people are going to want to see it. Even though it's like I cringe at the thought, I'm just gonna need to like avoid. It's the not internet nearly as bad as you made it out to be. No. It is not nearly as bad as you made it out to be. <sighs> well, I mean, well, thank you. Anytime you look back, anytime you look back on like early work, it always seems like terrible. It's torture. Like yeah. anytime. Is this yeah. the Chapman one? Yeah, Chapman yep. shorts. Oh my god. Oh jeez. Look at him. Look at this baby. Good lord. He, who does he remind me of? He reminds me of somebody. Does he remind you of your friend Brett? Yeah, yeah. just he looks just <laughs> like my buddy Brett Simmons, uh, <laughs> but but younger and more attractive. But, but, yeah, Ty, sure. who does he remind you of? <laughs> oh, it's a tip of my tongue. He, he does remind me of somebody. There's a little bit of a Rob Lowe thing going oh, on. Just a wow. little bit. I'll take it. Yeah. Well, I'll I was thinking, it. who's the one comedian from uh, Tosh? Uh, Tosh point oh? The Hangover. No, The Hangover. The guy who tases the dude in the face or tases him in the face. Um, but I'm just curious. So when did you first get the idea for doing Husk? And then when you had that idea, like what inspired it? You know, I think we've talked about this before, but when I was in film school, everything I was making was like comedies. I, have, I was always fascinated by how similar comedies and, and comedy and horror was executionally you know and i loved horror movies but i'm just a giant scaredy cat i'm just a big wuss we talked about with predator i i couldn't even watch that movie till i was like a teenager because i was just like so squeamish i mean i'm still squeamish and so i just more got inspired by the idea of like i want to take a crack at a horror movie before i'm done with school because it felt like kind of a place where i was under an umbrella where i can ex experiment and fail you know kind of focused on horror and scary films like that. So when you first went to film school, did you find, did you, was that your creative expression or did you find it later? Like that, Oh, this is what I want to do. I, I kind of found it while I, while I was there, you know, like I just kind of defaulted to really just comedies, like across the board, everything I was doing was funny, but then I kind of, I always liked horror, but I never viewed myself as a horror guy. And so I just kind of started to, 
explore it under the umbrella of the film school. You know, it's like, oh, maybe I should take a crack at it. And that's the big irony of it was Husk was the first straight horror movie I had made. Like I had done some dark comedies, but it was the first straight horror short I had done. And then that was the one that went to Sundance and had all the success. And then all of a sudden I was a horror guy and it's like, oh, all right, well, yeah, okay. Here we go. You guys like funny stuff? Oh, you don't think I can do that anymore? All right, well, I'll stick to the scary stuff. Then. It's interesting to me because I always saw you as a, as a, as a horror guy out the gate, you know. And I guess like right, I right. know, I know, I know you always loved horror, but I, I thought like maybe that you know. So I guess Husk is with the thing that you found that you found your voice and kind of found what you want to do. And do you think yeah. I have a, a a friend of mine who's a uh, he's a a, a great comedy writer for film and TV and uh and he's been really successful and I was like you've always written comedy you got comedy series you got comedy movies and stuff like that have you ever wanted to do anything else like blend genres or anything and he says I I do but whenever I look at an idea my mind by default goes to how do I make this funny or when I look at a scene my mind by default goes to how do I make this funny and that's always overriding uh, other you know genres or storytelling and so I wonder for you now, since you've been doing horror, if you're writing or doing some of these, like, how can I make this scary? It's funny. It's actually like when I did Husk, I had to really restrain myself from wanting to make it funny. I was like, no, 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 you don't do that here. It's got to be serious. You know, you got to keep it real serious. And I do still kind of lean towards that because I feel like, like the last movie I did, You Might Be the Killer, was kind of like the perfect marriage of my actual sensibilities of blending scary stuff with funny stuff. Because in my mind, People getting scared is when people when I get scared, I am hilarious to watch get scared. I'm I mean I, I hate that and I'm embarrassed by it, but like I'm the guy that people want to have around because the way that I respond to being scared is funny. But in my philosophy in general, I think people getting scared is funny to observe. It's horrible to experience, <laughs> but it's funny to observe, right? And so I'm constantly trying to like weigh like is it can it be funny yet or should it be serious or like what's emotionally happening here? Because I got jokes, but I don't know if I should use them, you know? I mean, the, the only thing you can't have be funny. The only thing you can't make fun of is the threat. Right. Right. I mean that, I mean, it, it's, it, it's okay for people to be funny when they're scared. That's all right. And some of my favorite uh, comedies are horror comedies. I mean, I think Shaun yeah. of the dead is a work of towering genius. Yes. Um, but they never make fun of the fact that if you get bit, you will die. Right. That's that's never the joke. And there are moments there where people get bit and it's you feel the tragedy of it. You feel yeah. the horror of it and the sadness of it. So you can mix the two things. You just can't make fun of the threat. No, is what it is. you are so right. Ty. Like that's that's the defining thing. And anytime I have issues with a horror comedy, it almost generally is that like when you make light of the threat, it becomes yeah. a spoof. You know, like I think of Scooby Doo. Like growing up when we were all watching Scooby Doo, yeah, like the the gang was funny and Shaggy and Scooby were funny, but the threat that they were dealing with was constantly serious and constantly real. Yeah. And I've I've carried that throughout my life, you know. Even when I did You Might Be the Killer, I mean I'm not here to talk about that, but when we did it, Fran Kranz was the lead and he called me before he signed on and he said, Look, I wanna know where your head is at because this movie doesn't work to me unless the danger feels real and the stakes feel real. And if that's how you feel, I can grab onto this. But if you don't, I don't want to do it. I was like, no, that's this movie would what won't work unless people's fear of dying is a real fear of dying and they can have hilarious reactions. But in that movie specifically, the thing you never make fun of is the fact that the horror at the idea that you may have been killing people and didn't know it. Right. You never make fun of that. Right. Like people's reactions to it and 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 you know people are there's a lot of funny scenes in it but but the person who's thinking oh may, maybe I have killed a bunch of people and I just don't know it the horror of that is never a joke. Right. And that can't be a joke. Right. Um or yeah, I I agree with your star that it just stops working at that point it just becomes a spoof of horror. It just becomes a spoof like if you take scary movie and you took their version of Ghostface but actually made him a viable real no jokey threat that movie stops feeling like a spoof it starts it stops feeling as much like a spoof right if the danger was real but those movies never felt threatening when we did the the first podcast on the horror shorts it was a lot of fun and the, and the 
uh, Patreons and people listening, they really enjoyed it. And so we we're going to do this again. And we want to kick it off with our dear friend, Brett Simmons, your podcast, uh, or your, uh, your, your horror short, Husk. And were you just a big fan of Children of the Corn, or like, where did that where did that thing all come from? No, <laughs> by the way, I'm, I'm by always... the way, Ty Ty has a great take on on Children of the Corn. He's like, he was like, that movie doesn't scare me because I can kick kids' ass. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I feel like yeah. if a kid leaps out of the corn, my boot would be in his face faster than I would be like screaming. <laughs> And I've always thought scarecrows were scary. Right. Yeah. And that's really what well, it is. Well, it's a, they are they are iconically frightening. Yes. You know, I mean, if you if you want to just show a silhouette of something to signal that a horror thing is about to happen, you can show a silhouette of a scarecrow. Oh yeah. And people will go, "Oh, this is horror. Oh, this is supposed to be scary." Yeah. I they're just iconically scary. No, and it's an image that everybody knows. What I found too was when you're trying to design a killer all the slasher movies we love watching are constantly needing to motivate a mask constantly. Yeah. You know, like my bloody Valentine's yeah. like, Oh, the minor, he's got the gas, man, you know, constantly justifying it. And when I thought about doing a horror short and what scared me, I just loved how easy it was with scarecrows. You just needed to come up with a cool design, but they were automatically, like you said, they, they come packed prepackaged as iconic and understood. And I don't need to tell anybody why their face is covered because we all know yeah. why it's, it's instantly terrifying. And I was like, Oh my God. And then I'm a giant Jurassic park fan. So I started thinking about it. I was like, man, well, what if these things were, if these things were animated, what if it, what if being in a cornfield was the equivalent of being in the Raptor coop in the third act of Jurassic park, you know, and these things, these scarecrows were just killers that were going to rip you to shreds and knew how to hunt and knew how to, there was just a strategy to how this thing was moving. Like, oh, what if it's a spirit animating these things and it's a singular spirit using these? Things? I just started imagining velociraptors. And then it all just kind of started spinning from there. But scarecrows have always been my favorite kind of subgenre when I was first getting into horror. I rented every single like horror movie that had scarecrows in it, and I was disappointed by every single one of them. And so I felt like I kind of owed it to myself to see is there a reason why this doesn't work or is there a way to make it work? And so that was kind of where I leapt off with Husk. So the the short uh, I've seen both the short and the and the feature length film. The short it has this thing that um, I'm both fascinated by and drives me nuts in horror movies, which is that I'll I'll be watching the thing and I'll be like, just do this, just do this, just do this, and then at some point somebody goes, oh, I'm just going to do this, and you're like, yes, they're going to do the thing, and then right. they just don't do it right. There, there's a, a scene toward the end of uh, the short where the person comes up with the idea, I'm going to burn the cornfield down, which I was saying from the first moment that that fucking yeah. uh, scarecrow showed up. I'm like, burn it down. You have a lighter. Yep. Just burn it down. Yep. Um, so when he does it, I'm like, yes, finally, somebody's just going to burn this thing down. And he stays in the cornfield while yep. he's getting ready to i'm like dude just get out of the cornfield get on the road splash gas from a distance <laughs> why are you still in there that, i know I, and I'm, what i'm fascinated by is look it, tropes exist for a reason and the reason they exist is because uh there is a way that stories can be made and when you get rid of all of those things people go oh i'm gonna write a story with no tropes in it well then you're not gonna write a story because there's no way to do that right yeah. The thing that I'm always trying to figure out in my own writing is how do I make use of those tropes and never step over the line into, and by the way, this is not me bashing your film. I mean, this is the first thing you're, you're you. straight out of college when you made this. Yeah. So uh, this is not me bashing your film. <laughs> um, uh, what, what I'm always looking for is how do I get right up to the edge of the obvious trope and not step over it? And it is so hard to do. Yeah. Like that is so tricky. Like, you need that guy to get grabbed. You need that guy to get to become victim of the, the thing that is happening in the cornfield. How do you do that without having him stay in the cornfield when he's splashing the gasoline? Right. 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 Like the trick of that. Yeah. What's interesting. Can you think of an example? And the one that I can think of, Ty, you remember that movie you told me about a long time ago where that 
where the the uh, that girl was highly competent. It's like she's like some kind of black ops, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, no, yeah, it's uh, it's um, your next. Your next. I love that movie. Yeah, I love your awesome. next. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know what I what I found really interesting with that, and I kind of you know is what do you do when you have a protagonist, a, a extremely competent protagonist that always does the right thing, who always, yeah. you know, and then how scary is it when you're like, oh, that's what I would have done. Oh, okay, he's doing, the, he's running when you should run. He's doing the things and it's still, af, you know, it's still, yeah. and it's still yeah. going to get him. It's kind of like Terminator, you know, Kyle Reese is, he knows what he's doing and he's doing like all the right things, but it's the Terminator, right. you know, right. <laughs> so that thing, it just keeps coming and you're like, Wait a minute, Kyle Reese is awesome. In any other genre, he would be, you know, kicking everybody's ass. He'd be killing everybody. But the Terminator just keeps coming. And in the 80s, and seeing traditional 80s heroes at that moment, uh, you see Kyle Reese and you're like, okay, I know what this is going to be. And then you're like, wait a minute, this guy, this guy doesn't stop. Oh, wait, he kills Kyle, Kyle Reese, dies? You know? Um, yeah, when we were talking about that, when we talked about Predator, you know, we, we start the movie with our team murdering a giant camp full of gorillas without even taking a scratch or like one little scratch. And then when the predator shows up and starts fucking them up, we're like, Oh, this is, this is way worse. Right. Um, yeah, I think, I think the competent protagonist does elevate the level of danger. I, I'm fascinated by Lovecraftian horror for that reason. Uh, we're speaking of which one of the shorts we watched, one of the love, death of robot shorts. I'm, I want to talk about the Lovecraftian elements when we get to that. But the thing I love about it is, is that it doesn't matter how competent you are, just your, just your awareness that you are in that Lovecraftian sphere destroys you. Yeah. Right. That's the whole Lovecraft thing. Even knowing about it drives you mad or destroys you. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite, one of my favorite Lovecraftian films is John Carpenter's uh, In the Mouth of Madness, yeah. mm -hmm. where our hero, our, our main character is extremely competent. We see him being extremely competent. He's a smart guy. He keeps making all the right moves. Doesn't matter. He's in a Lovecraft story now. You can't win right. when you're in a Lovecraft story, right? And, and it, so it just feels more and more and more threatening as we go through that movie because he keeps doing, like, the first thing he does is, like, I'm getting the fuck out of this town. He gets in his car and he leaves, right? Which, as you're watching, you're like, yeah, of course, that's what I would do, too. I'd get the fuck out of there. Yeah, go. And then you're trapped. You keep, you know, the road always leads back into the town and that the horror of that, the terror of that. I, and I love that he's competent. He's not stupid. You're in a situation now that defies all of your logic, defies all of your understanding yeah. and psychology. And, and it, it's nuts. Yeah. I know. I love that. You know, it was funny when we were doing Husk. I have, a, I had all these feelings when I was in school, but no experience really like messing with it. And I lived in a house with a bunch of guys that were all in the film school or like theater school and. I finally like we did like a think tank where we sat down and all we did was create the scenario of the scarecrows. And where I was like, man, like, what would you do? I mean, what would you do? And we just started brainstorming yeah. all the ideas of like, well, there's no way I'd do that, no way I'd do that. And the one moment from the short that got preserved for the feature was when one character chooses to jump in the truck and leave, regardless yeah. of the other's hesitance to do it, right? And both yeah. times when we were in the theater at Sundance screening it, the audience cheered. Like they're cheering for the guy that's like, yeah, get out of there. And then we were doing test get screening. Get the fuck out of yeah. there. <laughs> and it was the same thing when we test screened Huss, the feature, we were in New Jersey and the majority of the audience were like men, like blue collar middle-aged men. And I was like, there are no teenagers in here. I don't know if we're really like marketing the right demographic. And in the same moment when the character Chris jumps in the truck and drives off without everybody, like the, the Everyone practically leapt to their feet. Like, yeah, do it. Get out of there. Like, it was so funny. <laughs> Get out of there, kid. <laughs> yeah. But it stems hey, yep. from kind of like the whole, that's what I realized was, man, like this movie has to be about these guys' relationships to some degree because at this point, your emotional connection to the other characters is the only thing that would cause you any conflict from just sprinting away and burning the place down first thing it was like because i felt so trapped because in my own well, mind i'm like oh there's a scarecrow it just dropped off that thing yeah so let's go and let's burn the whole place let's down. go and yeah yep. forget it well i think i think that's i that's definitely one area where the feature film elevated the material yeah i mean there's a lot obviously because you had more money you had more time you had more experience in making them but there's a lot of things that are elevated but one of the things i really was noticeable to me is you had more time to make me like those guys right? so that 
I cared more when they were trying to save each other. Yeah. You don't, you don't have a lot of time for that. And, and in the short film, they immediately start out by being a dick to that one guy. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm like, why are you being a dick? Like that guy hasn't done anything. Stop being a dick. Right. Um, And then the other moment, the, the, when I was watching the short, the other moment, it was like, you're just an asshole <laughs> when they're like going into the corn and they're like, Hey, do you have a flashlight? No, I don't have a flashlight. And then later takes out a fucking out flashlight. A big old giant like, you're flashlight just a liar, too. man. I know. Yeah. It's just a bunch of you're just a fucking liar. <laughs> you know, I learned some lessons yeah. you know, after I made the short, I learned some, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what's funny too is like what was so weird about doing the short and I should apologize because it's not even really fair to call it a short cause it's almost 30 minutes long. It's like, yeah, it's, it's ridiculously it's, it's pretty long. long. And to be honest, when I made it, I, my priority when I made the short was building something as a pitch for a feature. And so I was never yeah. thinking about festivals. I didn't know enough about the benefit of festivals yet. I was solely focused on, I want to go out of school with something that can, I can present as a pitch for a feature. Cause I was already kind of like working on the feature script and kind of plotting it through. And I was like, I'm, all that matters to me is that something kind of hits the beats of the feature and kind of sells the concept of what it could be and what kind of the vibe would be. I never expected it to be a short that people would watch. And then I just kind of became embarrassed by how long it was. But the whole, the, <laughs> it's kind of why for a short, it does kind of span a little bit more story beats of a feature than a short. I don't actually know if it's a great example of a short for that reason, because it very much by design is kind of trying to present a a much bigger concept, you know, mm-hmm. was, you know what, Ty, to echo your point, what's interesting to me is I remember watching uh, now after I have uh, kids or even the first time I watched it, but watching the sixth sense and I cared so deeply for that little, for that little boy. And just because, you know, he, he, he's a little boy and he's sweet and he's sensitive. And I was so emotionally involved with that little boy that I am just hooked to the rises and falls. And I was thinking, man, if 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 you ever if you create something where you care about a character, you know, even if the movie's mediocre, but you care that deeply about the character, you're going to go, you know, and, and we talked a little bit about Prey and having her dog in it, you know, and you sit there and the yeah. one thing everybody says, is like, don't kill the dog. <laughs> it's like that dog was so <laughs> cool. And so, and you connect, you know, spiritually to that dog in a way. And, uh, and you know, and you go through that ride as when you care so deeply for something like that. Well, and, and the, the, you know, I mean, we were talking about tropes, the trick with the dog is, and this is well known and it's well used in TV and film and should be, if you love the dog, then anybody that the dog loves, you love them too. Yeah. And yeah, so right. by having that dog love her, we love yes. her because the dog right. loves her. And that relationship. So, I mean, and, them, yeah. and yeah, and that's that. I mean, and there's a reason why writers use that over and over and over again, because it works 100 percent of the time. Brett, what's it like when you're in college and you're making a film with your friends, you know, and, and you got the equipment from Chapman? First of all, did you have to put in your own money into it? And second of all, do you just get the actors out of your friends and you do it? It's got to be like. I mean, fun and exhilarating. I'm glad you're bringing this up because I really want to know about the process of making a short film like this. And, and the seven people who care about behind the scenes stuff probably will care. But I personally really care about stuff like that. I, I really want to know the process. You have this idea. How did you make this movie? I just focused on writing it first, you know, just kind of like, OK. And I, I was kind of trying to maintain my naivety for any of the problems I might be asking for. and. The biggest being, I don't live anywhere near cornfields. And so, <laughs> like, literally, we wrote this, like, oh, just killer scarecrow movie. And I, like, worked my butt off on the script. And then when we were like, okay, well, let's produce this thing. And the first thing was, where's, where's cornfields? And <laughs> it turns <laughs> out that California is the wrong place. So we had to drive up to Bakersfield to shoot it. But Chapman had a lab fee. Your senior year, your lab fee basically paid for film. And all the gear was you know, included in your tuition. So we had a rental house full of gear. And at that point, digital had just started becoming big. Like Steven Soderbergh was shooting his movies on the XL one. And so all those guys in film school were like, Oh yeah, digital. Oh, I want to get this camera. And then Panasonic had just put out the first, the first ever digital camera that shot 24 frames per second. 
which was kind of what like won me over was, wow, there's a camera that can shoot at the same frame rate as film. And now it looks like a movie instead of a home video. And so I just used my lab fee to buy the camera. And really that was the bulk of the budget. And then I, yeah, like you said, was like, I was just thinking about my friends being in the movie and kind of writing it with them in mind. I was one of the only guys in film school at the time that was making friends with people at the theater school. Like there's a weird rivalry between the film school and the theater school that I never understood because my high, I went to a school of the arts in high school and it was all one thing. And I was like, man, there's a bunch of great actors over there. Like, why are we not talking to them more? And I auditioned guys there and made friends with actors there. And I was like, there are very capable people who want something for their reel, who are willing to work their butts off and do a great job. And yeah, why not, you know, do that. That's smart. So, yeah. So I was doing that. What was really funny was, I don't know if you noticed in the short, but I did hold auditions for a couple of the roles. One of the guys that showed for the audition was Guillermo Diaz. And when we were in college, Half Baked had come out and we were obsessed with Half Baked and um, Dave Chappelle and Jim Brewer and like just loved it. And so when Guillermo Diaz walked in, he was like a celebrity to us because we watched Half Baked like every week. And we were like, wait, what? I finally was like, Guillermo, like, why are you here? I have no money. I can't pay you. Like the short's going to be like a bare bones budget. You know, it's going to be kind of miserable. And he was like, look, man, I just love horror. He was like, I auditioned for Freddy versus Jason. I didn't get a part in it. And it really kind of sparked my desire to do anything horror. And this sounded cool. And he was wow. like insanely generous with his time and his effort and putting up with you know, you have to like book a hotel for everybody, but you're paying for it on your own credit card or your own, just out right. of your own pocket. So it's a, it's a horrible hotel. I couldn't pay for security at our cornfield to protect our gear. So I slept in a motorhome on the cornfield with no AC. That was stupid. The house that we shot at in Bakersfield for the, like, the actual house, turns out the reason it was available because all the locals thought it was haunted and people told us we were going to be cursed for <laughs> shooting there. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And um, that's cool. <laughs> it was nuts, dude. We got stopped by the police. That's the movie. We multiple times. <laughs> I know. I know. We had the police stop our shooting multiple times. And every time I didn't have a permit because one, I was stupid. And two, I didn't think it mattered. I just was not educated enough to know. And the cops kept showing up. And every time I was like, oh, wow, we are, we are about to get shut down. And every time they were only concerned that we were shooting in this haunted house. Like, hey, is everyone okay here? You guys see anything? <laughs> Everyone's safe though, right? Are, are, are you guys feeling any curses right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> another behind the scenes thing. When we showed up to that house, there were like homemade Ouija boards, like pieces of wood that were carved and as like crayon was used to create the, like the Ouija board symbols. I was about to call it a keyboard. And, um, and like the little puck and everything. And I was like, this is a... Someone didn't go to the store to buy one. They made one, which feels worse. Um, and it made everyone kind of like <laughs> freaked out to shoot. But it was just like, when I look back at it, I'm just like, how did we do this? Like, I, I feel like my own naivety is the only reason why we made this thing. We didn't know that the cornfield was going to be insane to shoot in. And we didn't know the house was going to be haunted that we were shooting in. We didn't know how hot it was going to be. And everybody, because you're in film school and you just kind of, everyone's got the energy, like the, let's just go do this. Everyone was just gung ho for all of the insanity, like just absolute chaos of unorganized, no budget, short film, filmmaking in a cornfield in a haunted house. It's interesting how many first time accomplishment stories include that element of the only reason I did this is because I didn't know I couldn't do it. Right. And is so many first timers say like if I had known how hard this was going to be I never would have started right but I didn't know and so I just started and I just kept going until it was done I like the energy you know I think it's fun to hear about those energy of the college college days and doing that thing because we talked about all the time on the expanse uh I put some money aside you know Jeremy Benning our DP which was like kind of like our DP through all six seasons and I, we, I would, we, we, I'd work on like writing like little short horrors. And I was like, dude, on the weekends, let's do like a little short. And, and Jeremy's like, w I'm down. He's like, he got his building. And I was like, look, I got, I got some money so put awesome. aside. Jeremy has all, he has all the equipment. <clears throat> um, 
he owns a lot of his, all of his he owns a lot of his cameras what well, he rents them he makes a lot of money in his rent has it has a full studio rental facility so we're like dude let's do it and we'll, and you know I'll, I'll have you know all my friends be a part of it I had, I had you know all the expanse cast but also all the people that are in toronto shooting at the time and i was like you know we had all these fun ideas but once you get <laughs> once we got deep in the season jeremy be like hey man let's when are we gonna do that short thing and i'm like bro I'm, like this is you know working the many hours and then we rehearse on sundays for the expanse and i was just like and every season i'm like all right this season i'm gonna do it and he goes all right you said that last season i'm like no i'm telling you this season we're gonna do one it's gonna be fun every season because you know about two months in i'm like no nah, i gotta focus on the expanse because i'm so tired yeah. you know <laughs> And uh, I know and your energy that, is but... totally different. Yeah, I'm mean, like, dude. Like, because like, even when we did the short, you know, we're all in our early 20s, like catering. <laughs> we just go, hey, guys, you cool Subway? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? so like, no problem. <laughs> you know, yeah. where that would not fly. But the coolest thing that happened, you'll appreciate this, Wes, was when we did the feature, because of all the hardship and insanity of making the short, all of a sudden I realized that what I had just done was essentially had a dress rehearsal for the feature. Cause when we showed up in Iowa at the cornfield for the first time, the first AD, like all the crew, the producers, everyone shows up and just stared at the cornfield going, how the heck do we make this movie? And all of a sudden I was the authority on it all because I was like, guys, it's not that hard. We're going to plow corn here. And this is going to be our, for all of our dolly shots. Just lay track and leave it there for the next three weeks. This is where we're going to do all this. This is going to be our running track here. And this is where we're going to do this. And all of a sudden, I was just this young kid who was the only guy there that knew how to use a cornfield for no reason other than I dared to do it before not knowing how hard it was. And it was great. Yeah. I was like, at that point, I was like, you know what? Whatever we went through to make the short, this was why. This was why we did it. You know what? We're going to do our first time, that guy horror short we talk about short shorts so we're gonna shoot it on my farm you guys are gonna come stay with me and we'll let's do we'll, it we'll do it we'll set it we'll get all our friends involved yeah let's, and we'll let's produce there. our own movies Wes. Yeah. <laughs> is it gonna be the children of the corn wes's children are gonna be the the killer yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my children and the thing like that um I, yeah, we, we 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 have yeah. plenty of cool cool terrain and stuff to shoot on over here um and uh we just need let's we just need the it. idea let's do it Let's do it. We got to get Ty out of his house, so that'd be fun to do. There are so many shorts that are born out of just this going, this is, I have X, Y, and Z. What can we yeah. concoct narratively that uses these things because we have them in a hand on hand easily, you know? It's brilliant. Yeah. Let's go. Well, my, my favorite thing. I, to, you know how to direct a movie. I'm good at writing dialogue that sounds good coming out of Wes's mouth. <laughs> so yeah. we got those three <laughs> things. But, you know, what's, what's interesting is like uh, I have, you know, like the farm is like 20 acres, right? And there's all this pasture or whatever. And when I'm out there cutting, I'll just daydream. I just like daydream about like when I'm bush hogging the pasture, I just daydream about like scary things that happen would happen on that property and and there's like all these big rocks and stuff on there and i'm like oh wouldn't it be cool if this whatever da, da, da. but now i think about it man it'd be fun to like get together and and get all of our friends and we all stay here and and uh make something cool and and by the way just to just to clarify it wasn't children of the corn i said wasn't scary because of the kids it was that spanish film about the two the vacationing couple that go to that island where all the adults are dead. No, you, and it turns out the I know what you're talking. I remember the conversation, but you said yeah. that about the kids too. Oh, did I say yeah. about children of the yeah. corn too? Because <laughs> because yeah. I said because I, I said because I was trying to argue against it, and I was like, yeah, but it's kind of creepy because it's hard. The 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 reluct like they can fool you because the reluctance of violence towards kids right. is what is the weakness. And I, and then I was like, what if Janae's with you? You remember? <laughs> If we were talking about like yeah. if your wife is with you and like you're like oh if my wife's with me those kids are getting fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I don't know if you've ever seen this. I don't remember the name of the film. I never remember the name of it, but it's a it's a Spanish language film about this couple. She's very pregnant, and they're taking their last vacation before their kid is born, and they go to this little island off the coast of Spain. And it's like a little vacation island and they get there and they only see kids. There's no adults around and they can't figure it out. And it turns out that the kids have some kind of, you don't even know if it's like possession or what, what caused the kids to do this, but they have murdered all the adults. And so they start coming after this couple and they're not very old. I mean, I think the oldest kid is like a 12 year old girl, right? 
And I'm watching this film and like at one point, one of the kids runs at the pregnant wife with a knife and he just kind of knocks the kid down and, oh, uh, who can kill a child? That's it. They, they, he just kind of knocks the kid down and then they run away. And I'm like, okay, like I get the premise of this film is it's, 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 you don't want to hurt kids. Like I don't want to hurt kids. I don't even have kids. I still don't want to hurt kids. Right. Like I get it. You don't want to hurt kids. But the first time a 12 year old comes running at my, my wife with a knife, that kid is getting fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and from there on out, from there on out, I, I'm like, okay, my wife and I are leaving this island. We're getting on that boat and we're leaving. I don't care how many kids are between me and that boat. Those kids are going down. <laughs> and Wes is like, yeah, but they're kids. I'm like, you know what? They're coming at us with knives. Like th- there's a switch that flips, yeah. right? Where it's like, right. oh, a crazy psycho kids. They got to go. I'm getting a, I'm getting a weapon and I'm, I'm making a path to the boat. <laughs> I'm at least going to have a very firm conversation with their parents. <laughs> Brett, you can relate to this. <laughs> their parents are all dead. You can relate to this. I, I, you never feel the kind of rage until you're, you know, with your kids watching them play on the playground and you see another kid be mean to yep. your kid. Oh, I was, there's, I was literally that, about to say exactly that. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> yep. and you know, I literally, there was one kid that was, and he wasn't like, physically mean he was just being like he was mean girl and and i was like i might punch that kid's dad in front of him to teach him a lesson like (laughs) to show him what it feels like to bully you know what i'm saying oh man yeah i've been there for sure i actually had to stop taking maverick to the park for a little while when he was like really little because i would get so mad He'd be like, "Mm." like, i'm gonna go push this kid over says pushing my kid over when his mom is it makes you understand like those those rage parents at like soccer games. Oh yeah. We like run across the field and fuck up the parents oh. on the other side. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you get it, right? Yeah, yeah. Or go get in a kid's face. Be like, Who do you think you are? My, my two kids started football. And I mean, I am a nervous, like as I'm pulling into the thing, like when they're, when they're practicing and, and I always, you know, used to look at those dads and be like, what's wrong with those dads? Why are they? Now I understand it. Like I'm so emotionally swept up that I can't talk to anybody. I can't breathe when I'm watching the game. I mean, I'm so like emotionally yep. into it. Um, it. It is all of your trauma from your childhood is triggered when you have kids. It, it hits every note and you're like, why am I reacting mm. like this? And you're like, oh, there's some unresolved stuff down there from, yep. from the childhood that I haven't dealt with. Um. Yeah, I, this may be part of the reason why I don't have kids because I got way too oh, much dark bro, shit. A, I don't need any of that pulled it's up. It's a dark reservoir, yeah. man. You also um, learn how much you can't stand other people's parents. Just go out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. There are some parents out here that are psycho. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, that's that's going to be Wes when he runs across the football field and fucks yeah, up some other parent I, I, I at, the, have to take, at the peewee <laughs> football game. I have to take my wife with me. I got to be like, Jen, keep an eye on me. All right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Love, Death, and Robots. Yeah, we're going from Husk, which was made for like, yeah. like seven cents and your credit card, <laughs> yeah, some to Love, tape. Death, and Robots. Which which has all of the budget because yeah. they've done some of the some of the highest quality animation I've ever seen. Oh my god, I um, I, I thought that exact talk about extremes. When I watched it, I was like, <laughs> well, I mean, we are now on the complete extreme opposite end of the of the production spectrum on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, we did we did I, like horror shorts like Husk in the last one, but this. You know, this is the first yep. time for this podcast. Is the first time I saw any Love Death robots. This was Same. the first time. Really? Yeah, I was it's like, been oh my god, you hadn't crazy. watched them. Oh, but yeah, yeah, I it, it, yeah, I just haven't watched it, and so I did for this. Yeah. A friend of mine has written like three or four of them, so uh, I started watching them because of the, the ones he wrote, and I wind up watching them all because a lot of them are really good. Really good. Um, and yeah. is the is the animation? Do they use real people sometimes in it, or is it all animated? They they do a lot of well no what they do is a lot of very high end mocap. Okay. So on another project that I'm working on, um, uh, we've done a lot of research on that because we've been looking into that technology for this other project I'm I have in development. It's not just body mocap, uh, which you know we did a lot of on the Expanse as well, but they've actually got a system set up where they've got a bunch of cameras capturing the person's face in very high resolution. And they're using that as the template for the computer um, animating the features. So it winds up being incredibly lifelike. And you can really capture performance 
in a way that animation struggled to do in the past because you're getting every little detail of what the actor's face is doing. Yeah. Like you're picking up all the micro yeah. expressions in yeah. addition to like the expressions. Yep. Like it's really hyper realistic. Yeah, I man, I was blown away by that on that short. And not to like, take geez. it lowbrow, not to take it lowbrow, but um, was it the Aquila Drift? You know, there, there's, yeah. there, you know, there's, there's moments in there where I'm like, uh, uh, animation should not be making me feel this way right now. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you, did you touch yourself, Wes? No, no, no. Did you touch no, yourself while you were watching no, that? None of that. But I was like, this is uh, really lifelike. <laughs> I was, I was more going the other way, going like, man, there are some guys who really enjoyed animating this part. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, you mean there's some computers that really enjoyed animating yeah, yeah, that yeah, part? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, they had to render, and people probably needed to watch that render. So let's let's start with that one. Let's start with Aquila Drift then, which um, is based on a, a story written by a very famous sci-fi writer. So that's one of the things I love about Love, Death, and Robots is a lot of the episodes are based on short stories written by authors that I'm very familiar with, including, as I said, this one friend of mine who's written a number of them. So Aquila Drift, I. I love that story because it is the it is the classic unreliable narrator. It is the this guy is telling us a story and he's feeding us a false story because he's been fed all this false information. Right. And it made me think of uh so George R. R. Martin has a short story called This Tower of Ashes, which has a very similar plot line to Aquila Drift. I mean they're very different stories, but the the sort of this guy has been trapped in a nightmare he doesn't know he's in. Mm. And I've always really liked that sort of story. Uh, and that's what I was talking about with like sort of that Lovecraftian feel. For sure. It's, this guy's mind has been broken by what has happened to him. And he does, he's not aware of the true horror of the situation that he's right. in. Right. I, yeah. I actually had a reaction to this short. That I mean, it's actually it. It sums up my favorite thing about a good short film is it really to me a great short film is building up to a really great punchline because it's all you really have time yeah. for, right? So it's like I have a yes, singular punchline exactly. that I'm building towards. So the whole time I was watching, I was going, "Okay, well, one, the, the design of this is insane. The just all the conceptual work is just uh, incredible. But what's it building to? And the, the longer it went, the more nervous I was getting." And then the big reveal of where he actually was and that thing walking out the, for a fraction of a second looked like a woman. Yeah. And then I, yeah. I literally like my stomach sank the way that it does when I've read Lovecraft stories, you know, where they, they have the one moment of realization where like, this is horror beyond comprehension. No time to comprehend yeah. it. No frame of reference to be able to comprehend it. You're just, this is your reality. And I, I was like, sucker punched i could not believe how terrifying yeah. and i'm arachnophobic so that also really kind of like <laughs> sent me into almost a seizure well and 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 i think that so i'm a huge fan of short stories me too um uh, in print in prose and i think that i am i am a fan of short stories and short films for the same reason you just mentioned i don't think it is possible for a novel to gut punch you the way a short story can i think novels can be brilliant i think novels can evoke a world and definitely evoke a lot of emotional reactions and things. I think all of those things are true, and I write novels. But a short story can surprise you. It can sucker punch you yeah. in a way that no novel ever really can. And I think it is possible for a movie to do that. you got movies like The Sixth Sense, which pulls off a sucker punch like that. But it is much harder to do at feature length. Yeah. It's, it, is, it, is much, it is much easier to pull off at the short, at the short film length. Totally. Um, what I was struck with with the short film, and which was different but also in, in some weird way made it more spooky to me was that in my understanding and i could have been wrong but there's this almost like this web out in space in the dark side of space and it catches this ship and the thing that the, the 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 thing the creator of the web what it needs is is the ship that's what it feeds on but what was interesting to me was it was benevolent right it it created these uh images in these in the head in their head that there was to make them comfortable, like it cared about those things, so that they could live out the rest of their life in peace before <laughs> they died. And then some of the, and to me, that added, that made me, that made me really, that, that, was, that was the spooky side of it because 
the, yeah. some of the people they tried to awake, they weren't ready for the story. And so the fact that she cared about them and was being kind to them made it that much more spooky. And to go back to what we are talking about earlier about the imagery and how real it was, and it's like, whoa, that's, that's, that's really real. I mean, it's really intense. It adds, th- there's a purpose for it. There's a purpose for right. it because you see at the end what it really was. And you see like what he was doing with that thing, you know, and that thing is like, and it's like, whoa, and it just, it smacks you. Yeah. Well, the best twists uh, for me, my favorite twists are the ones that completely reframe everything you just watched. Right. And yeah. so it's like yep. that exactly completely. And what it did that I haven't seen a feature do that really freaked me out kind of on the heels of what you were saying, Wes, was the fact that the monster comes out, you see the reality of where he is. I feel like typically that would be the cut to credits. Right. And everyone was like, Oh God, the fact that we then go back to him reemerging and basically recycling through again this same lie, but we now know what it is and seeing her come out and hi and the whole that haunted me. Cause now I've, yeah. I, it's like reliving the thing that I'm reframing, but you're showing me. I don't need to go back to rewatch it to start to experience how horrible this actually is. Oh, that got me. I would have thought that was brilliant. And the implication that this may have happened many times. Yes. That that the the illusion only the illusion only holds for so long, and then the mind starts to reject it, and then you wake up and you see what's really going on, and then she puts you back into she oh. wipes your memory and puts you back into the thing. <laughs> it's so and scary. how many times has that happened before? You, you it doesn't say you don't know, but it, it implies it may have happened many times. And the monster yeah. cares for you as you're trapped inside of this nightmare. And it, right. it, there's something about that that hits me in a different way. It's a yes. different kind of spooky, you know. It was the line yeah. she had right before he woke up. What, what was it like? Just know, just know that no matter what, I care for you, or whatever that line was yeah. like right before. And yeah, that got me too. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and you see, you see the pain that she's going through because she knows how shocked he's going to be when she when he sees who she really is. You know. Yeah. Mm. Oh. I love that. That's one of my favorite shorts I've seen in a long time. Oh, that man. Was unbelievable. It, yeah, it was unbelievable. Well, now I need to watch the rest of the I'm now I'm hooked on the on the series. They're they're they're, they're all they're all worth your time. Uh some are better than others. Some are real standouts. Um uh, but they're all worth your time. Uh I, I I don't think there's any of them that I was like that was a waste of 20 minutes. Who, um, who was But speaking of the Lovecraftian thing, uh, what what was the name of the one on the boat? Um, oh, the uh, uh, the bad traveling. Yeah, bad yeah. traveling. I loved that. Was probably my favorite one. That one in Aquila Drift were my is my competition for favorite ones. I'm still freaking about with the spider. <laughs> I'm still freaking out with the spider. <laughs> Did the crab freak you out? The crustacean because it's kind of spider ish. Yeah, well, you know what? It starts to delve into it again, like Lovecraftian. Like the only thing that's up there with spiders that freaks me out is the ocean and sea creatures. Yeah. Like I, I'm just the ocean in general really freaks me out. So that definitely, uh, that definitely sparks <laughs> a whole other fear. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for all of this. It's so I I think the thing like the ocean doesn't freak me out, but I have great respect for the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, especially say. when you're in it right. because everything in the ocean with you has a huge advantage in that that's where it lives and you're a stranger yeah, I'm there. on your turn you are yeah your body is not designed to move quickly in the water your body is not designed to fight in the water like you are an outlier and even if a creature is much smaller and weaker than you if it's in the ocean with you it's better than you yeah because it's it's designed yeah. for that. It comes from there, yeah. and I think that's the the fear of the ocean is you know you're 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 bobbing around in you know in the waves you're out having fun and then something brushes your leg. Nope, nope. There's nope. that immediate reaction of fuck no, I'm out, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's because if you're smart, because because you know you're out because no matter what that thing is, that's where it comes from. You don't come from there. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. I know. It, it, there, I was trying to think of the Lovecraft story. It reminded me of where all the creatures are emerging from the ocean to take over the town. It's just a real famous one. I'm yeah. like blanking on the name. But uh, he did that a couple of times. But uh, yeah, the the town of Innsmouth. Yes, 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 and, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a there's a great Stuart Gordon film called Dagon. Yes, which I is know based it. on. Yes. Yeah, 
Dagon's uh, awesome. Uh, but yeah, it's it's that thing where the things come out of the sea and the people in town start to turn into things from the sea yes. as as the influence of these elder gods begins to take over right. the town. Yeah, it's great stuff. But I feel like even like when the crabs came out, like it kind of reminded me how what my fear of the ocean is, is that I know there is a layer that I see the top of the ocean and that there's a whole world of I don't know what underneath, which is what terrifies yeah. me. And it's why it kind of reminded me of that short, because I find that logically in my brain, anything that wants to emerge out of the ocean, I'm going to believe <laughs> exists because <laughs> you know? I can't say it doesn't. And the, the idea yeah. that anything like that could be dwelling down there is so plausible to me in my own imagination. I don't go, no way. I'm instantly like, yeah, oh my God. Yeah, we're, we're dead. We know this. For, this is a scientific fact that there are so many species that live in the deep sea right. that we have never seen before, that we have never captured on camera, that we've never, you know, the ones that we do know about are the ones that die and then get caught in a, like a fishing net, right? Like yep. we knew about giant squid years before we ever caught one on camera and only recently have we ever caught them alive on camera it's a very recent right. thing um and these things were fucking terrifying you know like 25 feet long with with uh tentacles filled with spines like if that <laughs> thing grabs you you're fucked right <laughs> and and you're looking at that and you're going what else is down there yep <laughs> <laughs> like I remember, you know, being in the Navy and sit at nighttime, I'd go up to the flight deck and I'd sit on the edge of the flight deck and I would look out and you're in the middle of the ocean and I would look out in the ocean and there yeah. was something so ancient and private and random mm -hmm. and you, and I'd watch the water like bashing off the ships. And I would think, you know, that if, 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 if I was buried alive somewhere in the world, there's a good chance that somebody can find you, that somehow somebody's going to come across your grave if they're digging for whatever. But I was like, if I fall in here and sink to the bottom and I'm at the bottom, nobody will ever see me again. And oh, there was yeah. something so. No, you're gone. Forever. Yeah, you're gone oh, forever. Man. And yeah. there's something yeah. so dark and terrifying. And, and there's a, such a mystery to it. Like you said, Ty, we yeah. only know a certain amount of what's down there. And, you know, when I, I would terrify myself just by being on the top and staring in there and, and thinking that this could quite like if you're if you're walking somewhere on land or if you're driving somewhere. There's been people there before you, but it's quite possible if you're sailing across the ocean that you're in a spot that no, no man has ever been in before. And that's yes. freaky to me. Well, there was a statistic that got that something I think James Cameron was talking about at one point of, of the percentage of the ocean that's unexplored. And it was yeah. really troubling to me. <laughs> it's like, it's oh, way no. more unexplored than explored yes, exactly exactly yeah, way more uh that we've never seen the bottom of than that we have seen the bottom of so i i, I base a lot of military stuff in the expanse on submarines because you know i mean it's it's you're in a pressure vessel you're surrounded by something that wants to kill you it's very space-like right when you're in a submarine and so i read a lot of uh historical stuff about submarines and and all of that as part of my research and every now and then a submarine goes down, I can't imagine a more terrifying thing. No. You're in that sub, something goes wrong, and right down to the bottom you go, and you are never coming out of there. No. That is your tomb now. Yeah. And a lot of the times, the guys are alive for days. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. After the sub goes down. Do you remember when that Russian sub not too long ago was down there, and they could hear people clanging on the subway, they could, or on the, on, to, 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 clanging... Yeah, or it's like, come help me on the thing because the radio is banging for help. Banging for help. Yeah, like, that's geez. terrifying. That is yeah horror. To <laughs> so so this is a great <laughs> setting for this story when it starts. You know, out yes. in the storm, and when it's something <laughs> yep. about storming too, because the water is yeah. all around you. The water's in the air. The water's on the thing, and then you know it's you're you're barely hanging on to this little piece of wood in the middle of this ocean. Oh well, it's like the it's like the ocean flexing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great description of it that he, so I, I often say this, people talk about like, well, we'll never ex explore space, it's too dangerous. My answer to that is exploring space now with our current technology is not any more dangerous to us than going across the Atlantic was to people in wooden ships, right? Wow. The ocean wanted to kill you every moment you yeah. were out there. And Wes's description is fantastic. You're clinging to this little piece of wood and canvas hoping that it stays intact long enough for you to get where you're going. And the ocean doesn't just decide to swat you. 
because it will sometimes. It'll just like, oh, here's a rogue wave. Fuck you. <laughs> and you're <laughs> now, like, you're just dead. And like, there's there's no way to stop that. There's no way to know that it's coming. It's just, oh, here you go. Now you're dead. Yeah. It's like, what are yeah. you supposed to do? And by the way, every direction that you look, there's nothing. Yeah. And the ocean actively wants you dead. They start with the terror of the sea being in a storm. And then you have this monster that's terrifying. That crab like thing, sometimes big, like, you know, in the, it reminds me of the 1950s when you have like the big ants or the big whatever. That, that doesn't yeah. really do much for me. But this crab scared me. It was very yeah. spider like, you know, going to, you know, what you're talking about. That's what Brett. got me. Was I like, there's this thing's a little too arachnid for me to feel comfortable. <laughs> But then the other layer on top of that was the psychology of they had to feed this thing. This thing would talk to them through a dead body, which that always gets me when they do. <laughs> you know, like when he raised the guy up because he needed to talk to him. And the guy's like, hey, come back down and we need to talk. And he's like, you rang. But the psychology of like this thing, <laughs> this thing makes a deal with this guy. And yeah. so but he, they need he needs to be fed. And so that's just a great premise. That's a great horror premise. Like they have to, the, the question of who dies, who do we, who do we betray? Who do we kill? But also yeah. the moral question of, do we let this thing get to an Island in when, and it's having, right. and, it has, and then the fact that it has babies, it raises the stakes in a way. And that's, that part was like when he went down there and how the babies came out. Oof. It kind of reminded me a little bit of, um, Little Shop of Horrors, which doesn't get enough credit for like being really kind of creepy because it raises, like you said, like the moral debate of, wow, so what do I feed this thing? And the measure of like, as an audience member, I'm, autom I'm, 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 I'm automatically sympathizing with the moral debate of what do I do in this situation? I also think you know, when like you're, when you're writing, I, I'd love to know what you think about this too tight. Or it's like, I've always loved the idea of getting inside the head of a creature, but a talking creature automatically robs it of its teeth, you know? It, yes. But the idea of a creature that has another, an alternate way of giving voice to what it's thinking really fascinates me. And it's, it's a challenge to do while maintaining the threat, right? And the whole idea of animating yeah. people and speaking through them, I was like, well, this is about the, the most terrifying way ever to give voice to this thing <laughs> so I can imagine. Terrifying. It's yeah. <laughs> you had a human puppet. I agree with what you just said, but I do think that you can do the talking monster story. But when it's a talking monster story, it's a different story. It's about the idea of being it, both intelligent and aware and sentient and a monster. Right. That's the story now. It, the story is, what is it like to be, to know that you're a monster and be a monster? Mm. And you can tell that story, but it's a very different story from like the traditional, it's a slasher horror story, right? right. Uh, so you, you just got to be aware of that. Like if you're going to have your monster talking, you're now telling a different kind of story than, than yeah. maybe you were, you were setting out to do. Yeah. Well, and to me with this, it made it twice as scary to me because it was intelligent and it had a goal. Yeah. And it was desperate. This isn't just a beast. You know, and it, it was hungry. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's not just a beast that's mindlessly killing. This thing, is, it thinks things through, which always is, you know, straight monsters do not scare me as much um, as something that is thinking and can match your wits totally. and, and be planning. Well, and this was, I mean, they have a great sequence in there where they decide to fight it. And the dude, like, chucks an axe at it. And it just bounces off the carapace, right? I am terrified of things like there is zero chance to win. I hate the no win scenario. And so when you, when you create a monster that cannot be beat by whatever I could do, like if it's a monster, it shows up and like, Oh, you can kill this monster with a shotgun. I'm not scared anymore. Cause I have right. a shotgun and I'm, I'm just going to go get that and fuck this monster up. But when this thing like, you know, bullets are bouncing off of it and axes right. are bouncing off of it and it can, and it's so fast and so powerful and it can just tear you apart with its claws. Now I'm fucking scared. Yeah. And when mm -hmm. the guy's like, we have to feed it. I'm like, yeah, no, I understand that. We got to feed this yeah. thing. Cause if it, <laughs> if it comes in here and eats us all, it's just going to win. Right. We can't, we can't survive. So just, yeah. you know, who wants to volunteer? <laughs> and to me, that's what elevates it from just a story where a monster climbs on and is eating everybody and they're just trying to survive. What elevates it is he makes a deal with one of the guys and then they have to figure out amongst themselves, how do they feed it? Who are they throwing in there? 
And so then there's that thing. And so that elevates it, you know, to me, the whole story, and it makes it so much more interesting and complex. What was the, so my kids came in and like, I missed the part where they were giving, they were writing something on paper and giving him the notes. And then he came back out and shot the two guys. You know what I'm talking about? Like he, they were, they were writing something on paper and putting it into a, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about I, in the, in the show. I, I'm, I don't have a clear memory yeah, of that. Same. So he was, t- he was taking, so my kids came in and I thought maybe he was, they were like, they were voting who's going to live and who's going to die. And then, then he, he came out and said, look, I, I marked these cards. Joseph, do you know what, the, what I'm talking about? Is it this scene? Oh, can we watch the scene? Yeah. Yeah. That scene. Oh, oh, uh, is, is this the ones who, who wanted to go to, uh, an Island that had people on it? Yeah. I, is that, yeah. I think he, he was, he was wanting them to vote and yeah. he was making his decision of who's going to be fed. So they were voting on who's going to be fed? No, they were voting on where they're going to go. Or were they voting on going to the island? They were voting on their destination, and two of the people voted to go to a closer place that had other humans on it. And he was saying Mm -hmm. they were cowards because then the creature would be able to eat the people on that island rather than risk their mm. own lives to take the creature to a, fir- right, a more distant right. but uninhabitable island. Yeah. I like see. Like a longer yeah. journey. What yeah. a great story. I mean, what yeah. a great setup. So, because if he took them to the further away island where there's nobody on it, then the only thing the creature can eat is them. Right. Yeah. So the only threat, the threat only falls on them immediately. It doesn't fall on anyone else. It's interesting because it's kind of like, how much are we willing to carry this burden longer as a sacrifice to the greater good or take the easier way out and lift the burden off of our own conscience. Yeah. But there's a twist at the end when he pushes the last guy in and he says, I was lying about the thing. Everybody put an X on it and he pushed him in. So I guess that means everybody was honorable and he lied about it so he could keep feeding that creature. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, so he did the, you know, he betrayed them in that way, but then he did the right thing by, you know, blowing the ship up and, and jumping off and yeah, they did a lot with a little bit of time. A lot yeah, and that's, and that's the thing with, so Joseph was putting up the, uh, the other, the third film, which I think is a perfect example of this, which is Sonny's edge. Did you guys watch Sonny's edge? I didn't get yeah. to watch Sonny's edge. Okay. Um, so Sonny's edge is a, a short film about people who connect their, ner- their neurological systems two monsters and then have the monsters fight in cages. And it's sort of like uh Avatar. remember real steel that yeah, but it, but it's but but it's it's for for combat sports, right? But these monsters are they're genetic, they're created in labs, they're grown in vats or whatever, and the losing monster usually dies. So the the people don't die cuz they're, you know, they they unplug when the mon- their monster gets killed. And there's this woman who's got a monster that just keeps winning every fight. She wins every fight. I mean, it's a cool looking monster, but it's not the scariest monster. Like some of the monsters they show her fighting are way scarier looking than her monster. But somehow she always finds a way to win. And I'm going to give away the end here because in order to talk about this, we have to talk about it. So spoilers, go watch Sunny's Edge if you haven't seen it yet. The, the end we discover that the, the woman that we've been watching is actually a, a construct, like a robot. And that at some point in the past, this woman, when she was connected to her creature, she was killed. Her human self was killed. And so the creature is her. The robot is the thing she's, she's, she's controlling remotely so that people will like, you know, so she uses the human robot to like make her deals and get paid and that kind of stuff. But her actual soul, her consciousness lives in this monster. So the edge she has in every fight is she can never lose or she will die. That is So the edge awesome. she has, yeah, so the edge she has is everybody else is playing a game. She's not playing a game. She's fighting for her life in every fight. Oh, my and gosh. And you get to the end and that reveal, you're like, holy shit. What, what a reveal. What a great twist ending to this story. And reframes everything you saw before that. And that's the kind of idea I want. That's the kind of idea that I want to find for a short film. That's brilliant. What did you think of that one, Wes? And I, I, I was like, you know, kind of how you were affected. I was a massive fan. And what I love too, is it comes with a betrayal. 
you know, and there's a little yeah. bit of that, there's a little bit of that payoff because she's betrayed by, um, so in the beginning, this guy comes up to her and he wants her to throw the fight. And she's like, no, we don't do that. We know now yeah, we the can't. reasons do why, why she doesn't throw the fight. And he was like, why? I'll pay you, you know, this much money and why, you know, $500,000. Why don't you throw the fight? And she's like, we don't lose here. You know, that's not what we're going to do. And there is, and you come to find the story that she was raped and killed, like what, what Ty is saying. And so the purpose of her fighting is, and there was, this was mentioned in there, but the purpose is that she's going through and fighting all the guys that abused her. Right. And that was like uh, one of the things there. But at the end, because she wins and she costs him a lot of money, the, the guy that's trying to, to buy her out, he brings somebody in. They have like this kind of romantic thing going on. She turns, she goes to kill and they think that they murdered her and they smash her head open and they realize it's a robot. And when they when they see that it was a robot and they're like, wait a minute. And they start to think and then their minds connect to oh, wait she's the monster she's not the robot so the terror in their thing you know because she was raped and killed like what ty was saying and, she, and then that her soul went into that monster and then they're they're in that room with that monster with the monster uh, with and the that, monster that, oh, shit moment of like we and may so, have fucked up <laughs> and so it's such a great payoff because there's that moment of being like you know being emotionally moved like affected by the betrayal because uh, I, I keep trying not to give it away, but I guess we already gave it away or whatever. But there's this girl that she has a connection to. And this guy, she's kind of posing as this guy's girlfriend, but there's a connection they have between them. So she comes up to talk to her. They, you know, they go back and they talk, and they have this really touching, romantic moment between the two where they you know, see each other, and there's a connection. And then that girl turns and kills her. And when she kills her, you're like, oh, my God. And the guy comes in and like, oh, man, they betrayed her. And you're so like, you know, affected by that. And then they're when they smash her head open, they realize like, oh, wait, no, she's a robot. And when they realize that she's a robot and then then they have the realization, oh, wait, she's the monster. And when the monster comes up in the room, it's just such a great emotional payoff because she's been betrayed, you know. Did you see the witness? The the the, uh, yeah, yeah, the short yeah. the witness. The witness was cool. I mean, that's the other thing was it it, it started to. Uh, I love the style of it. The style of it was yeah radical. There's no uncanny valley in that one. There's kind of some Hitchcockian storyline mm-hmm. though, you know. No, I thought um vibe and tone. I know I you're mean, a uh, Hitchcock guy. Yeah, I mean Hitchcock's the greatest ever. But um, I just like really? how surreal it felt. It was just, I was kind of dazzled by oh, the yeah, style. Yeah, of he's the a short. big Hitchcock guy. I, I, I actually was like, man, I, I feel like I need to just rewatch this a few times because I've just been so kind of swept away by the style of this one. Ty might find it interesting. They did not use motion capture for the witness. It was all keyframe. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You know really? what's funny about that is I do feel like that I I could kind of feel the it. motions were kind of jerky because with I yeah well I I noticed so what's keyframe basically the, it was animated it was animated in the computer not uh, motion capture sometimes the motion capture I think motion capture is brilliant for getting the micro expressions on the face and that's where I think motion capture really pushes things to a whole other level with animation it, it does something that animation struggles to do. But then the actual movement of the human body, sometimes I feel the limitation of it where it's like, I kind of want to see just that slight exaggeration or slight bounce or slight stretch or buoyancy that kind of makes it feel just a little bit more, by comparison, sometimes it feels stiff, you know? And and as somebody who is in development on an animation project, that that is a conversation that comes up a lot is how what where do you want what level of realism do you want right do you want a little bit of exaggeration that lets the the viewer know that it is animation so they get rid of that uncanny valley thing or do you want to go for hyper realistic where that where you draw that line is is definitely a a, an open conversation for sure that's so interesting i love that and and there are arguments for both i mean the the hyper realistic stuff has advantages but the more sort of obviously animated stuff has advantages as well so you got to pick which thing are you which thing are you trying to do 
you're right about the Hitchcock thing to us with the with the witness. Yeah, yeah, looking in the thing and the and what's kind of cool is it was Hitchcockian in its premise, but it has like this supernatural element where they're locked in this circle of murder, you know, this internal yeah. circle of murder where they're constantly kind of you know it's a, it's a circular thing. And it had a bit of memento vibe. There's like a little bit of Christopher Nolan. A little bit. It, totally. You know? the, the city um, is so fucking weird, though. Yeah. Like, it's everything yeah, about is. that city is so fucking weird. Well, that whole, that whole sex show was, like, really weird. Yeah, the sex um, club. And it had such a specific, yeah, that sex club thing. And it was, uh, and that, the one thing about all of these is the art direction and the conceptual art and everything is just so insane and it's so int- you know it's it's so otherworldly it starts to make me kind of that's what i kept really getting sidetracked with was i start when i get dazzled by something like that i kind of start getting distracted by like how do they execute or how do they communicate this to someone or how do they how do they achieve this result because there's no real world reference to go let's do this it's kind of outside of the box and i go like man i wish i could have heard some of these conversations yeah i see and and i'm i'm a i'm a world building guy so i watch something like this and my first thought is how do people live here like do they have (laughs) jobs do they like like what 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 is what is the experience of being an everyday you're not the girl trapped in the the circular murder loop you're just Dude who lives in that the guy city. At the bank. What is your daily life like? What what is your experience of going through your day? That's really that's where funny. my head always goes. Well, she had a job. That's really funny. She had a job in the in the leather clad people were in the incest club. They had jobs. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Are those the only kinds of jobs that and exist? Her manager. In this world, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you guys for hanging out. This has been fun. Goodbye, Brett. That's awesome. Thanks for having me back, guys. Say goodbye, Ty. At any time, man. And uh, also, be thinking anything you want to talk about, like Ford. Like you know, we we got uh, we got we still have Alien. We still got um, not Alien. We still have uh, Halloween, um, The Mist, uh, Starman. Dang, you know, for John Carver. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm, you guys haven't I'm, done Halloween. I'm stoked about. It. Well, we we've done we've talked about Halloween. I'm sorry, the fog. We've talked about Halloween at Nazi. Yeah, I thought so on the show, but we haven't like done. We haven't done like an official, or have we? Have we, Joseph, done like an official Halloween? Yeah, we did it for Halloween last year, right? But we've talked about it so much. Love it. The fog is amazing too. Um, fog is that's awesome. But I'll think. I'll think. Please like and subscribe and all the things. Say goodbye, Ty. Is he paused? <laughs> Say goodbye, Ty. Yeah, Ty froze. Did Ty freeze? No, oh, he rage quit. I think he's re- <laughs> he's rebelling. Oh, right there for the outro. <laughs> Did Ty freeze? I got it.